In this video, we take a closer look at the formation of a metal structure. The starting point for the formation of a microstructure is usually the liquid state. From this, the metal is poured and solidifies. The microstructure with its typical granular structure is then formed. The conditions that must be met for such solidification are explained in more detail in the following. In the liquid state, the metal atoms are distributed in a completely random manner. Due to the high temperature, the atoms have a relatively high kinetic energy. In this state, the attractive forces between the atoms are not sufficient to bind them together permanently. Heavy collisions with other atoms cause any bonds that may have existed for a short time to be broken again immediately. When the melt is now cooled, the kinetic energy of the particles decreases as the temperature drops. When the temperature falls below a critical point, the mutual attraction of the particles becomes dominant. The bonds between the atoms can now become permanent. In this state, the solidification temperature has been undershot and the actual solidification process begins. Solidification usually occurs simultaneously at many points in the melt. In this way, many small grains are formed from the melt. Although each grain has the same lattice structure, this is spatially oriented differently from grain to grain. Due to the acting attractive forces, more and more particles from the melt now attach themselves to the already solidified lattice structure. This process continues until finally all particles have joined the metal lattice and the grains touch each other. The microstructure has now completely formed. Since the crystal structure of the metal is formed during the solidification process, it is also referred to as crystallization. In steel and most other metals, the grains are only a few micrometers in size and are therefore only visible under a microscope. In some cases, however, such as galvanized steel sheets, the individual grains can also be seen with the naked eye. The typical shimmering of the grains is caused by the different lattice orientation, which causes a slightly different reflection behavior in each case. The typical shimmering of the surface of polycrystalline silicon solar cells, whose grains are also visible to the naked eye, is created in the same way. Let's come back to the formation of the microstructure from the melt. For a melt to solidify, the temperature of the melt must first be below the solidification temperature of the material so that atomic bonds remain permanent. The difference between the local temperature of the melt and the solidification point is also referred to as undercooling or supercooling. Supercooling is absolutely necessary to trigger the solidification process. Simply reaching the solidification point is not sufficient. The existence of supercooling is therefore a first condition for triggering crystallization. Although it is a necessary condition, it is not sufficient to cause a melt to solidify. We will discuss the second necessary condition in more detail in the following. Using a hand warmer, it quickly becomes clear that just supercooling a liquid is not enough to trigger a solidification process. Sodium acetate trihydrate, whose solidification temperature is around 58 degrees Celsius, is frequently used as the liquid in hand warmers. However, this liquid state is still present at sub-zero temperatures. In this case, the melt obviously does not solidify even when supercooled by more than 50 degrees Celsius. This metastable state is also called supercooled liquid. Obviously, in addition to supercooling, another condition must be met for a melt to solidify. The hand warmer demonstrates this very clearly. If a small metal plate is pressed inside, the solidification process starts suddenly. The reason for the sudden triggering of solidification is tiny unmelted residues of sodium acetate trihydrate that have settled in the fine grooves of the metal plate. Only when the plate is pressed does the melt come into contact with the unmelted residues. These act as so-called nuclei, at which solidification can begin. Nuclei are therefore spots in a melt that provide the necessary activation energy for the start of crystallization. Due to the complexity, we will go into more detail on the nucleation process in a separate video. By the way, water can also be brought to a supercooled state of well below minus 10 degrees Celsius and is still liquid. However, this requires pure water without any impurities that could serve as nuclei. Of course, the container in which the water is contained must also be free of impurities. However, as soon as the water comes into contact with other particles, for example when it is poured onto a table, Nucleation is triggered there and the water immediately begins to solidify. Even the smallest vibrations can trigger the solidification process due to the resulting pressure waves. In nature, supercooled water plays a role in the formation of freezing rain. These are supercooled raindrops. At first, 
they fall to the ground in a liquid state. When they hit the ground, however, the impurities present there serve as nuclei for crystallization. The raindrops then immediately begin to crystallize and become ice. This instantaneous formation of ice as the raindrop hits the ground is called freezing rain. Transferred to the solidification of metals, supercooling and nucleation are therefore always prerequisites for crystallization. If one of these conditions is not met, the melt cannot solidify. In principle, nucleation in a melt can take place in two different ways. When foreign particles serve as nuclei, that is particles of a different substance than the molecules of the melt, this is also referred to as heterogeneous nucleation. This type of nucleation can be caused by impurities in the melt or by the particles of the vessel wall. Such impurities are the most common cause in everyday life that supercooled liquids are usually not observed, and therefore one might conclude that only supercooling is required for solidification. The solidification process preferentially occurs where the impurities are located, such as on the vessel wall. The probability of nucleation is therefore not homogeneously distributed throughout the melt, but is concentrated in areas where impurities are present. For this reason, such nucleation is also referred to as heterogeneous nucleation. However, not only foreign particles, but also the particles of the molten material can serve as nuclei. In this context, one speaks of homogeneous nucleation. Homogeneous nucleation can be caused, for example, by the random arrangement of atoms in the melt in the form of a unit cell. Due to the large number of particles in a melt, this is not as unlikely as it may sound. Homogeneous nucleation can also be caused by unmelted residues, but this is unlikely in molten metals. The probability of a random arrangement of atoms in the form of a lattice structure is homogeneously distributed throughout the melt. Thus, there are no preferred locations for the particles to come together. Therefore, this type of nucleation is called homogeneous nucleation. By knowing the conditions necessary for crystallization, the microstructure can now be specifically influenced. For example, the probability of homogeneous nucleation increases to a certain degree with increasing supercooling. This is because strong supercooling means a lower kinetic energy of the particles and thus a lower probability that formed nuclei will dissolve again due to heavy collisions. Therefore, strong supercooling usually leads to increased homogeneous nucleation. The melt then begins to solidify at many nuclei simultaneously. The result is a very fine-grained microstructure with many grain boundaries, which is characterized by very good strength and toughness. Another way to achieve a fine-grained structure is to introduce foreign particles that trigger heterogeneous nucleation. This process is called seeding. For example, a compound of iron and silicon is often used to seed cast iron. However, since the added foreign particles tend to dissolve in the melt over time, Seeding should be done just before solidification or during casting of the metal. The microstructure formation during crystallization can basically be divided into two phases, nucleation and nucleus growth. Both the phase of nucleation and the phase of nucleus growth can be specifically influenced in order to form the microstructure according to the later desired properties. Due to their complexity, these phases will be dealt with in more detail in separate videos. Let us now take a look at the solidification process of a melt from a macroscopic point of view. The example of the hand warmer already mentioned illustrates another phenomenon in the solidification of melts. Obviously, heat is released during crystallization of the melt in the hand warmer. In this way, the hand warmer is used as a heat source on cold winter days. In principle, this phenomenon of releasing heat during solidification is not limited to the hand warmer. Ultimately, such a release of heat takes place during every solidification. Let's take a closer look at this process. The heat removed from the melt during cooling leads to a reduction in the kinetic energy of the molecules and thus to a decrease in temperature. When the solidification temperature is reached, the kinetic energy of the molecules has decreased to such an extent that the binding forces permanently bind the molecules together. In this process, the energy decreases abruptly because the molecules in the lattice structure do not move at high speed but only oscillate around a fixed position. The energy difference between the liquid and solid state corresponds to the heat energy released during solidification. This heat energy is generally referred to as the heat of solidification and, in the case of crystalline materials, as the heat of crystallization. The heat of crystallization released inside must be dissipated from the solidifying melt, otherwise the heat energy would break the bonds again and remelt the already solidified areas. Thus, while cooling removes heat from the melt, 
the melt continues to release heat of crystallization as it solidifies. Therefore, the external cooling and the internal heat release compensate each other during solidification, so that the temperature does not change during crystallization. This constant temperature is called thermal arrest and is shown as a horizontal line in the cooling curve. Only when all the molecules have bonded to form a lattice structure and solidification is complete can no more crystallization heat be released. From this point on, the temperature begins to drop again due to external cooling. In principle, mixtures also release heat during solidification. However, due to the mutual chemical influence of the substances, the heat of crystallization can generally no longer fully compensate for the cooling. As a result, the temperature drop is not completely stopped, but only slowed down. Thus, the cooling curve becomes flatter during solidification.